Guys, in just a second, I'm going to be introducing author Greg Renoff, and his book is called Van Halen Rising. And I found Greg on Facebook. Um, I'm not even sure, but I saw a post on Van Halen, and then I found him, and and then I got his book. And I actually listened to his book um, about two years ago, and for the past six months, maybe even longer, I've been begging him to come on, and now he finally is, and I'm so excited. But um, his book is called, and I'm going to read it because it's a long title, Van Halen Rising, How a Southern California Backyard Party Band Saved Heavy Metal. And those are the questions I'm going to be asking him is, how did they save heavy metal? Because I was, I was listening to music then, and I don't know what happened. I really don't. His book was amazing. I, I know more about Van Halen from him because he talks all about the very, very beginning of Van Halen. And um, But I'm going to be asking him, you know, how did they save it? And uh, so here's Greg. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to finally be speaking with author Greg Renoff, and I am going to give you a little blip of what we're going to be talking about. See if you, if you know the song. Okay. That beginning, they had me at hello, okay? <laughs> Greg's book is called Van Halen Rising, and I'm going to read the rest of the title, How a Southern California Backyard Party Band Saved Heavy Metal. Hi, Greg. Thank you so hey. much for talking with me. No, you're welcome. I'm glad we could connect. This is great. Oh, this is awesome. I listened to this book, like I said, about two years ago. Um, I loved this book because I love the history of bands. And, you know, when when you're growing up with these bands, you don't really know like what happened or how they got together. And and as I got older and I started to really appreciate like what has to happen. And with this band and in your book, it's almost like all the stars aligned and all these four members end up in the same town in mm -hmm. California. I, they're so close in age. OK, Alex, Eddie, Mike, Sam, no, not Sammy, David Lee Roth. They all end up in the same place in Pasadena in California and later Sammy. But this book is about the history of them, the four original members of Van Halen. So I, I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you for reading it. Yeah. Listening to it. Yeah. Reading, listening to it. Yeah. Listening, reading. Cool. So what, what started you on the journey of trying to write the book? Good, good question. Yeah. So my journey probably started when I was uh, 14. I heard jump on on MTV and that sort of made me into this oh, huge Van Halen fan. So I was about 84. I was like, yeah, 14 years old. And I <laughs> actually got to see Van Halen on the 1984 tour. Oh. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's basically a, a long story short. I basically scalped a ticket from a kid at school who didn't really like Van Halen, but his brother had bought him a Van Halen ticket and uh, ended up going. And that just sort of blew my mind. And that made me a fan for for life and saw Van Halen over the years after they broke up with Sammy a couple of times and in, in the eighties and life kind of goes on. And I ended up going to grad school and becoming a, a historian. And right. I always had read rock magazines as a kid and had read circus magazine, hit parader. And I was, I was really uh, somebody who just ate all that stuff up. Like you said about the history of the band and about what the band was doing. And uh, as a historian, I really, you know, I had gotten interested in, in the prehistory of of bands, I had actually read a, a couple of books. I had read a book about Jimi Hendrix called Becoming Jimi Hendrix, a book I really, really, really liked. And there's a couple of other books that kind of looked about the beginnings of, of bands and how they started. And that's that's all that sort of kind of fell together for me in thinking about how did Van Halen get get going as a band. And uh, when you look, looked at the books that had been written up to that point, Ian Christie's uh, Van Halen Saga, Everybody Wants Some, covers their their history of their whole band really really well but it, it doesn't really go into great detail about their their beginnings and a lot of books were like that because ultimately that was what was kind of out there and what was known and plus let's face it the big story is about you know how the band how the band sells platinum records and all this stuff and so you know for me as a historian and a writer i got curious about how they started and that that's where the 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 things got going for me uh 
to be perfectly honest with you, I, I when I first started looking into doing this, it was just I thought I was going to write an article or like a an extensive blog post or something. It was just sort of like on a whim. I had some free time and uh, started looking into it and actually was able to uh, over Facebook find a gentleman who owned a club that I wrote about in Van Halen Rising called The Rock Corporation, The Rock, which was in Van Nuys, California, which was a biker bar. And I found him on Facebook and he had a Facebook page. There's only like 30 people on this Facebook page, but it was it was dedicated to the club. And I reached out to the person who owned the club and uh, we talked and you know, it turned out he had hired, as I talk about in the book, he had hired Van Halen, and and then he went into the whole story about the wet t-shirt contest and all of all stuff. And I said, oh, there's something here, and you know, about this, and it just sort of all snowballed from there, and kind of took off into this idea to write a book, which was not was not the original game plan. I didn't sort of you know say, okay, this is the plan, I'm going to write a book. It sort of became the the obvious thing to do after I worked on it long enough. Well, what I loved about it is because they're you know they're this California band, and I had no idea. Okay, I didn't. I knew that Eddie and Alex were originally from Amsterdam, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what? I was a big, huge Valerie Bertinelli fan back in the, you know, sure. one day at a time thing. So for me, like, their wedding was like this crazy, like, oh, my God, she gets to marry Eddie Van Halen. 1981, like... I know. It's like, yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. And you cover that, too. But um, it's just like, so it, I think that it's like I fell in love with their songs. But then the fact that that happened, it was like our little, you know, royal wedding in the rock world. <laughs> and yeah, and I actually remember as a kid uh, watching One Day at a Time and seeing the Van Halen poster on the wall. Like one of, like after she married Eddie yes. and she was still on the show. I don't remember. For a couple more years after she married Eddie, she was on the show and like they'd show her bedroom and she'd be. You know, she'd go in her bedroom and slam the door. It'd be like a, a Van Halen poster on the wall. And you'd be like, oh, you know, she was wearing the necklace or whatever she was wearing. So you sort of saw the, the wink and the nod towards her, her life outside of television. But, yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great. I mean, yeah, that was the other piece. That was that was such a huge – that was such a huge event. People Magazine, Us Magazine, oh. National Enquirer. It was like this big, like, you know, yeah. rock star Mary, America sweetheart, you know. Absolutely. And anyway, so, you know, that's when I got really interested in them, of who they were as people. I mean, before them, they were just the, you know, they were the this amazing rock band that, you know, we every party we'd go to in high school, that's all they'd play. I mean, it really was like those albums because, um, and I, I think you, you touch on this, like, they are such a guy band, but the girls are the ones who really love them. And, and David Lee Roth and, you know, and Eddie, right away, I mean, every girl's like, oh, my God, David Lee Roth, you know, like he was just amazing and he did these high jumps and, you know. But to hear the story, I was so interested to read your book and listen to your book and because I wanted to know how the, how did this, like, these four guys who are seemingly so different end up meeting. And I I learned so much. I mean, there there's so much to say about the beginning and uh, and the part about Gene Simmons finding them and, you know, Milton Berle's nephew, you know, being their first manager, quote unquote. I mean, they, they had a crazy, crazy beginning. But what I love the fact that you point out is that and this is what I tell my children. I used your book as for parenting skills. So just so you know, <laughs> that's a scary thing. <laughs> God bless you. No, because huh. what you emphasized over and over is that they didn't quit. Okay, they yeah, weren't. Yeah, I mean, so true. They weren't necessarily, you know, like oh, they started playing in these backyard parties, and all of a sudden, boom, they're rock stars. You know, I mean, sure, they had. If you look at it, it's like okay, well, they became rock stars fairly quickly, but when not really when you go back to the fact that, um, you know, the the musician, like when Eddie was playing the piano. OK, like he, in order to uh, you point out, like in order for him to play his drums at the time, he had to play the piano for what, like an hour or two or something. Like his mom was like, you have to play the piano, you know, and and like they're the music and they just practiced and practiced. And what did they do? They just practiced all the time, you know, and I have children that would be, you know, doing different sports and stuff. And I'm like, you know, they weren't nobody said, oh, Eddie, it's time to practice playing your guitar. Like nobody said that to him. Because what was he doing? You've said it over and over. He had the guitar in his hand. He had, you know, a notebook. He had, he was playing all the time. And we, did a, you find a, that yeah, inspiring? I did. I did. I mean, that was one of the things that I thought was as I went along and writing. Again, and so as I started to research and write the book, I started doing all these interviews 
with people who had grown up with them in Pasadena and kind of trying to get the story from observers and, you know, old interviews with them, of course, and get their, their point of view. I interviewed Mike Anthony and other people who were um, involved with being, you know, being their, their early roadies and these types of things. But from, even from outside observers, people who went to the parties all the time said these guys played all the time. They gigged all the time. They worked. And, th and that's the thing I think that is really inspirational is that I think there's, there's, it's easy to assume the, the, uh, the Michael Jordan, the Beyonce, the Eddie Van Halen, these super talented people just sort of naturally, they have a talent and just sort of like, they don't really have to work at it. And that's really not how it works for, for people is that Eddie, you know, did wake up in the morning, put his guitar on. I mean, there's that one part in the book I love where he, he, uh, Dave Roth is talking to, this is 1976. And he's talking to a guy named Tracy, um, Tracy G who later went on to be Ronnie James Dio's guitarist. And so I, I interviewed Tracy so Tracy was 16 at the time and started going to see Van Halen playing at these clubs. And, and he ended up talking to Dave one day and he said, oh, man, you know, Dave is like 22. Right. And so and Van Halen's not famous outside of L.A., but, you know, he's still like Dave's like a rock star walking around these clubs. And he's like, oh, man, you know, I play guitar. My name's Tracy. He's like, how much is Eddie practice? And Dave's like, well, you know, listen to me, kid. He wakes up first thing in the morning. He's got the guitar on. He eats lunch. He's playing guitar. And, it, you know, it was true, really. It was it, that whenever you talk to people, they said that whenever he could you know, have a guitar on him, he was practicing all the time, just playing and playing and playing. And that's how he got so good. And so it's not just the musical ability, which was obviously there, the native musical ability, but it's cultivating that. And I think that is an inspirational story. And, and to get back to what you said about, you know, I put in the book, but it always sticks out of my mind. With roadies, a gentleman by the name of Greg Emerson, who's now deceased, um, told a story to another one of the other guys who was a roadie that at one point he, he, basically pushed or pulled Eddie aside, Alex Sider talking to him. He's like, well, you know, what's going to happen if you guys don't make it basically? So it's like right before they kind of get a record deal. So it's 76 when they've been at it for years and the brothers were like, what do you mean? What are we going to do? We're, this is what we do. We're musicians. In other words, if we have to play clubs for the next 10 years, we're, this is what we're going to do. We're not going to become a banker. <laughs> we're not going to become a lawyer. We're not, that's not, that's not who we are. We are musicians and this is our craft and this is what we do. And so, whether we become famous or not, or whether we become rock stars or not, we're going to be working in nightclubs playing music for ever long it takes for us to you know, live our lives. And so that sort of determination to sort of commitment is something, too, that I think, you know, this idea that you get into the arts to become famous, that clearly, for I think for Dave, that was the goal. But I don't think for Eddie and Alex, that was their their set goal was be, to become famous. Now, of course, they were trying to get a record deal, and of course, they wanted to to make it in the music industry, but that was not their driving I don't, ambition. I, unlike Dave, which is a very different type of deal in terms of that, that alternate, <laughs> those alternate personalities kind of coming together to make one band. Yeah. And um, you, in your book, um, I was really inspired by David Lee Roth because uh, you go on to say like how he was really the marketing guy, you know, how he realized like um, early on, like with the music, this is the part I've really liked is that because why do we like Van Halen music? I didn't really understand why it was so catchy, right. but Dave was always like, you have to be able to dance to it. And I was right. like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that they were playing rock music, okay, that you could dance to. And that was because of him, because he was, he understood that. He understood what was going to sell or what was going to play, you know, people at a party. What do they want to do? They want to dance, you know? And of course they have songs about dancing too, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know that I, yeah i mean like dancing right away is basically like you know like think about all the songs in 1979 that was the height of disco that came out that was like dancing queen all these dancing right. songs i mean it was smart to be like oh okay like yeah let's write a song about dancing you know and it's like how many heavy metal bands write a song about dancing that's actually kind of like you know it's not dirty it's not nasty it's just sort of like a romantic like you're t you know you're old enough to dance i mean it's actually pretty if you read the lyrics are like pretty g-rated lyrics and so and it's you know it's it's sung sincerely by Dave, and so yeah, they were smart in terms of how they 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 approach that in terms of trying to write pop songs, and like you said, also to like go okay, you know we're you know, this is what we what we are. We're going to be a band that's going to be appeal to the masses, and we're going to try to be something that people are going to yeah want to want to want to move to, not just sort of bang their head to all over all over and over again. Right, and like I was telling you, I never got to see them, which I was very sad about. Um, you know, I kept missing it, whatever. And I'm near Philly, and for some reason, it was like they'd come around, and I'd miss it. And I was talking to. Um, <laughs> that might have been your parents too. They were like the newspaper ad for Van Halen, like crumple that up, throw that away. I I I don't know. I, I oh, just. Oh, it, oh, grow out of it. I yeah, it was. I don't know. 
I had a lot of children in the 80s, so I, I have six children. So I was like, I was either pregnant or then I, you know, like they would come around again yep. and something else would be going on. But I had the opportunity. I was my, my cousin, my older cousin who had passed away a couple of years ago, very suddenly. My last conversation with him was about Van Halen. And okay. he was telling me that he went to see Van Halen twice, one with David Lee Roth and one with Sammy Hagar in Philadelphia. And he I told suspect. me that it was their first tour um, with Sammy. OK. And everybody had um, signs that said David sucks, you know, David sucks signs all over the place. And um, some, you know, road manager comes out on the stage and says, you know, Van Halen will not be coming out on this stage until all the David Lee Roth signs get pulled down. And he said everybody put their signs away. And he's like he said he, it was like a totally different respect level that they he had for them because yeah. David was there. You know, you can't take away what David contributed to Van Halen's success, and obviously they realized that. Yeah, that whole the whole uh, the whole breakup saga, of course, is the other reason in, in terms of if it was a tattoo to wrap the book up with seventy eight, seventy nine. It sort of avoids that sort of <laughs> depressing Van Halen yes. ending, which unfortunately has been the ending for every Van Halen fan for the last twenty five years. There seems to have been some like you know some other shoe that drops that's never very very uh, uplifting for the fans. So. Um, yeah, the uh, of course the the story about Sammy Hagar being considered to be in Van Halen before before Van Halen gets famous is sort of the uh, the ultimate plot twist, which was out which actually was out there. That story had been out there in the '80s and stuff like that. But then oh, I got really? to talk to Ted Templeman about it, and he sort of explained a little bit more detail about what he was he was thinking that he had worked with Hagar and Montrose, and that Sammy was such a great singer, and that he was concerned about Dave's vocals. But Ted will tell you himself that. Uh, He'll he'll say to this day he said if I had made that move if I had tried to done done that power play, which he never got close to doing but he considered it he said that would have been the biggest mistake in rock history he'll say that he said that would have been the, I would have, right. it would have been like basically like taking Robert Plant out of Led Zeppelin that's what he'll tell you he said it would have been the biggest mistake anyone could have made and he's like I'm just you know I just I'm glad I saw it through with Dave and we just we found a way to make it work and it was great you know he's like it's just amazing band and it was the best. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I did want to ask you, because I couldn't remember if you had put this in your book or not, about, okay, so we talk about, you know, how how uh, they were all such great musicians, okay? But Dave was the front man, okay? So right. he wasn't the musician, but he, he's this lead singer, which not everybody's happy about. You know, they don't all think he's the best lead singer ever. But, I mean, ha he was um, an athlete. And I always wondered, and I and I was like, can I can remember if you said it or not? Like, what was he? Was he was it a karate? You know, was he a martial arts guy? What was his gig? Because he was obviously yeah, he did. He, I mean, he did martial arts actually pretty uh, pretty early on. It's, it's interesting. I got to talk to um, when I started doing interviews with people in Pasadena. I got to talk to a couple of guys who were very close with Dave in middle school, like the, you know, people who sat at the lunch table with Dave and. You know, geeky, he had kind of a short haircut, and he was a little unsure of himself. But at some point, he sort of had resolved that he was going to become a musician and a lead singer of this. You know, basically, he was telling people that I'm going to be a, 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 you know, a rock star, which is an interesting career aspiration for a seventh grader. But that was his deal. And that soon after that, David started doing martial arts and basically started working out and like getting himself where, where you know, girls were starting to flock to him. And this one of the guys told me, he said, you know, when we first started hanging out. Dave and I were good friends, but like I was the leader, basically. I was the I was the man, you know. Like everyone was kind of like following me, but it's like Dave, like super, super surpassed me. He like went way past me, and it was like, damn man, this guy's got it. And just you know, had enormous respect for how Dave kind of committed himself to this vision for what he wanted to be, and that he was so willing to to um, to work for it, work to it. You know, Dave was guy had a lot of interest. He was an avid reader. Um, one of the, the the guy who I interviewed for the book was talking about how they would walk home and they'd talk about you know, talk about books, Huckleberry Finn or whatever other books were works were big at the time. Music, so uh, horseback riding. Dave did horseback riding. So Dave was a guy with a, you know a lot of diverse interests, very smart. So he wasn't sort of a one trick. Like the guy told me, you know, he said some guys like you knew they were the guys who all only could talk about cars. So it was this, you know, it was the '60s. So it was like hot rods. Some guys all, you know, you told him like, "What's up?" And they all they want to talk about is their car. Where Dave had like 50 things you could talk to you about. Said so super smart and kind of uh, laying the groundwork there for that 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 guy who's going to be able to talk in these interviews with Martha Quinn and MTV or Rolling Stone magazine and sort of ramble on these, these topics where people are just sort of like, wow, this guy knows a lot, a lot about a lot. He really did. Right. I think, you know, when reading your book, it's like they kind of put the word party into, you know, rock bands too. You know, the 
partying back then was always a huge thing, but I felt like I was reading, especially, you know, back then there wasn't the internet, but it seemed like every time you read an article about Van Halen, it was about, you know, the, the massive parties that they would be holding and trashing hotels and, you know, doing all that kind of thing. And I think it led to their persona, you know, as, as who they were, you know, like they were these, and, but they'd always have these big smiles on their faces. It's like, look at us, we're awesome, but we, you know, and then they you hear they've trashed a hotel and you're like, wow, no, not those guys. They didn't trash a yeah, hotel. Yeah, it's interesting, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right, that's sort of like the, the nice guys, yeah, they would do that. Yeah, interesting because, um, you know, one of the things about the book that I try to get into is about the heavy metal-esque parts of Van Halen and sort of kind of, I try to, lay out in the book that yes. at the time for what was considered heavy metal in the late seventies, they were, right. they would have fell in that category, but you know, they weren't, they weren't Judas priest. They weren't like in leather, right. like they were like, you know, like you said, big smiles, Eddie smile, this great smile. Dave was always smiling, cracking jokes. Look, they're having fun. And they, like they took like things. Anthony. It was, yeah, it wasn't, and it wasn't, they didn't take themselves super seriously. Seriously. So, like so many bands <laughs> took themselves. So yes. like, it was always so serious. And so, you know, strident with all this stuff. And so that was the thing too about the party band atmosphere. And that was fun too in, in terms of working on the book, obviously the the idea that the, the the legends about the party band, you know, that I had heard these little clips in Circus Magazine or you'd hear in an interview like, oh, we used to have these backyard parties. And when I got to talk to the people who threw the parties, it was, you know, it was amazing to hear these stories and just, you know, you'd hear hear them and you'd be like, oh, okay, well, I've, I've talked to so many people. And you talk to 20 people and 30 people. You know, it's like, <laughs> and you're like, wow. I mean, like you know, interviews and the stories start to all line up together and you're like, damn. And then you look in the newspaper and it would say something like in the past the newspaper it would say police um, interrupt, you know, just uh, right. disturbance in suburban neighborhood. And they didn't mention Van Halen, obviously, but they would say police broke up a party in suburban Pasadena. To, you know, a thousand kids had gathered in, you know, hear a rock band. And you're like, damn, wow, they really did. They really did make a ruckus. And they sort of, like you said, had that that persona. Even before they became famous, I mean, they were already that was sort of their 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 stock and trade, and that's how they got they got a name for themselves. To be honest, that's how they did it. Is that they they didn't play nightclubs at first. They played, you know, for twenty people. They played for two hundred people in somebody's backyard. Yeah, and that another thing is their music was so fun. You know, like you said, it wasn't serious. It wasn't like the heavy metal that was like, oh, uh, was like made you think and have to, you know, get in a certain mood. Right. Their music right. was all about like, you know, oh, this is a great song. This is a great song. This is, you know, fun to listen to. It's fun to dance to. It's, you know, and especially as they got on too, that, you know, there was a little bit more like with Jump and Panama and, you know, different songs like that. Like, So anyone who's listening, I want to just jump in here real quick. Anyone who's, who's listening to this after you're done subscribing to the channel here and listening to this interview, go over to YouTube and put in Soul Train Van Halen Jump and look at the 1984 <laughs> episode of Soul Train with people dancing to jump. I mean, it's a Dave must have been yes. like so happy because this is like, you know, he came out of that that uh, environment in Pasadena that where he was uh, bussed into John Muir High School, which was very integrated, black, Hispanic, Asian and to, I could only imagine that when he saw that, and I'm sure he did in the 80s, he must have been like over the moon, like they're dancing to my song, song. on Soul Train. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, like he actually went to school with with, um, you know, kids who would like go on Soul Train. I mean, that was the deal. Like it was that was a very it was the black power movement. So he was he was kind of a minority kid in this this heavily uh, integrated school. And so, you, yeah, you said about the dance music and like, come on. I mean, they're not going to play Iron Maiden on on. Uh, <laughs> On Soul Train, right? I mean, that was part of the sort of thing. So it's like, you know, they had this they had this niche where they sort of like made you smile and they wrote these these songs that were heavy enough to get the kids who were like kind of like uh, heavy metal kids interested. But on the other hand, they were pop songs. Yeah. And I, I'm even thinking of like their videos and stuff, you know, like Hot for Teacher. And, you know, they never took the, it was all just fun. Like all just like, you know, they're going to sing this song. I don't know. It was crazy. But I'm going to tell you what. My, the the biggest shock of your book was, and then I want to hear what your biggest shock when you were doing the interview is, okay? My thing I did not know, and of course I didn't know about their background and, and about them younger, but I did not know about Gene Simmons. And I had mm -hmm. read a Gene Simmons book. Um, you know, he's he does like these 
these business books now and you know right. motivational yeah, books yeah. And, you know yeah 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 i know and i, I was laughing because it's like gina has written a lot of books yeah and i was so shocked because i'm like oh my gosh it almost does make him seem like a genius like he here's this you know guy in kiss and you know he's he but he's a smart guy and he right. sits back and goes you know what they're pretty good you know he's he doesn't he doesn't care. He doesn't have any skin in the game of thinking that they could possibly be as good as Kiss or anything. He's like, yeah, these guys are pretty good. You know, let's just help them out. And it kind of shows that he was kind of a business guy in that sense. Is like he didn't mind finding a band. But that was my biggest shock in your book was like, wow, Gene Simmons was involved. Like he was and it didn't work. I don't want to give any spoilers, but it didn't really work out. But, you know, right. they he gets to say it. That's what works <laughs> in Gene Simmons' world. No, I mean, I think that Gene, I, you know, it's funny because uh, this is like a big sticking point with a lot of Van Halen fans about what Gene's motivations were. So when you read Dave's book, Crazy from the Heat, which came out in the 90s, Dave is very much of the opinion that Gene was trying to steal Eddie and Alex for, for Kiss or just to steal them away. And oh. Gene has always said that, no, I didn't want to do that. And it's sort of this. I don't know. It's it's sort of unclear, obviously, about what Gene's motivations really, really were. Uh, but yeah, Gene is certainly a guy who did spot the talent. I mean, he saw he saw that he had been tipped off by Lita Ford and Jackie Fox, among other people, local, basically local musicians, you know, from the Runaways and people who were around when Gene was in L.A. and said, "There's this band Van Halen, you should go check them out," and, and uh, ended up signing them to this this deal. And of course, it didn't it didn't work. But yeah, Gene Gene saw the talent. Uh, Gene is also a guy, of course, who loves to talk about this and has has, has basically. I've made a lot of uh, a lot of references, a lot of interviews. But the other thing that's actually really cool is that for anyone who is purchasing, I don't know if you about Gene Simmons Vault. Uh, you, may, you may have seen it like he was on like with every like every television show known to man in the last two months about this Gene Simmons Vault. <laughs> he actually he he actually, uh, as I describe in the book, did three Kiss songs as demo tapes with Eddie and Alex, where he basically said, "I'm I need to r write up these songs for the new Kiss album. I want to put them down on tape so I can give them to the rest of the band to to record." And had those guys do them, and those songs are actually coming out on Gene's box set, which is really kind of cool that that's going to come out because that was always sort of this mystery about whether that really happened or not. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, look, I think it's, I think, I think Gene, whether or not he actually got anywhere at Van Halen, I think it's been very good for Gene because Gene has always been able to say, right, with sincerity, you know, I discovered Van Halen. I discovered. Um, I don't know if he, I knew it. You know this, but I just, you know, I discovered Van. I, I know. Yeah. I do. I discovered Van Halen. Right. right. And, you know, and that's, that's like this whole, like whole, that whole issue about who discovered Van Halen. But it's just, it's, I think, I think Gene has gotten city mileage out of saying I discovered Van Halen. Right. So yeah, right. Gene is, Gene's a big shock. I, or, or, uh, I think some people, yeah, like, cause that's kind of like, I don't know where Gene appears. You know, for me, I think the biggest, the biggest surprise was how much, um, how much pushback there was from Van Halen's high school fans when Dave joined. Now, I had no idea about that. I mean, nobody really did know anything about that. No. But that when, and it sort of makes sense if you if you yeah. read the book in context, that the, uh, the three-piece mammoth, which was Eddie, Alex, and Mark Stone, the bass player, right. was kind of the passing to high school's favorite band, and they played all these parties. And then you have this guy who's in this other band, Red Ball Jet, which everyone thinks is sort of a weird band because Dave is so flamboyant and so out there with what he does. I mean, you know, these guys are standing there in their jeans and flannel shirts with their cigarettes playing Black Sabbath. And Dave <laughs> is singing, Dave is singing, like, you know, Brown Sugar by the Stone, shaking his ass in whatever, like a, like a vest with no shirt on. And, right. you know, he's like, you know, and he's like in high school. Right. And so it's like this sort of thing, like, what, like, dude, I was at the lunch table with you two hours ago. What's your deal? Like, why are you walking around in those clothes? Right. And so that when Dave joins that there was so much, you know, from the guys who hung out with the Van Halens and basically Eddie and Alex kind of having to apologize to people. But, you know, you have to give huge, huge credit to Eddie and Alex for seeing the potential there. Yeah. Because I tell you, when everyone else is saying this guy can't sing, this right. guy's not good for your band, get him out of there. I think a lot of people would have been like, you're right. But they knew and to stick with it and they stuck with it and they were a hundred percent, a million percent. Right. I mean, obviously they're a million percent. Right. I think I, you know, I'm of the opinion and people might disagree that without the, all the pieces together without Dave, Eddie and Alex, or however you want to put it, the Dave and Eddie, they probably never would have made it. I think that the, my personal opinion is that, you know, assuming they didn't get a singer like Dave, someone who was as 
magnetic or someone who was able to, to steal the spotlight from everyone like Dave, that, you know, Eddie and Alex might have been great, great session musicians. They may have made it in rock in some other way, but sort of have like a Van Halen. There would not, probably would never have been a band like that with those guys because Eddie and Alex are both kind of reserved. I mean, they're not they're right. not the type of guys who were, you know, they 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 came here as as immigrants. You know, English is their second language. And obviously, Dave is a guy who, like, knows every word in the English language <laughs> and can talk for, you know, could talk for for talk for 20 minutes straight without stopping. I mean, he was the perfect. I mean, he looked great. And he, he did did everything well. The only thing he didn't do particularly well at the beginning was, you know, he didn't sing as well as some of the other guys who were he would have been sort of matched up against in the world of, of rock out there. But he got his, you know, he got his act together and, and it was great. The first Van Halen record is a classic and he sang great on it. So it's all Absolutely. the credit to David Lee Roth for being the guy who saw it through and for Eddie and Alex for spotting the talent look, before anyone else did who really were like, this guy, we need this guy. When everyone was like, you don't need this guy. And they're like, yo, we need this guy. This is our guy. Yeah, I, I uh, saw in an interview or, or something. I mean, I've watched them all on YouTube and, you know, because they're fun, you know, to watch them sure. talk about them. And and somebody had said that whenever um, Alex and Eddie, like, you know, they were so tight. But when they'd right. have a fight, they'd fight in Dutch. So nobody would know oh, yeah. what they were talking about because, yeah, they, yeah. they you know, so nobody really knew what they were fighting about because they'd only speak in Dutch. And I just like that vision. That's all. I just like. There's actually so the other thing, too, for people to, to check out on uh, YouTube is if you type in uh, Eddie and Alex Van Halen speak Dutch, there's actually some radio interviews that they did in Holland or in Europe where they were speaking. It's really kind of cool, actually, to hear them speak yeah. Dutch. And they're, they're, flu they're fluent. I mean, they're because their parents right. spoke. And so it's like they were bilingual and all the way. And it's really kind of interesting that they would. Yeah, they would. All of a sudden you, you, you hit the like break into the break into the Dutch or whatever, or speak these phrases. And uh, yeah, it's again, it's, it's such a, for me too, the other thing was really compelling about the Van Halen story is the, is the sort of the tale of the, of the brothers who come to America with their family. They're really, really lower middle-class, really blue collar, salt of the earth people. They end up pairing up with a guy whose father is a pretty successful doctor and they end up you know, going, going and, and becoming famous. It's really a cool, a cool American story. Absolutely. And since you're an American history major, like I, when I saw that, I was like, of course he is, because I, I, this book wouldn't be this book without you, just so that everybody knows it. Anybody could have, you know, done research or but the story and how you wrote it, you know, I I loved every nice. page of it, okay? Well, it's it, nice it's a great, you. great story. You turned, you know, this story into such a great story. And I enjoyed every minute of it. I was like, I couldn't wait. Like, I want to read, I want to, you know, like, I would kind of break it up. Like, okay, don't listen to all of it at the same time because I'd, I'd want to listen to all of it. And, you know, but your storytelling is what make, made it for me because I loved all the stories, but you're a great storyteller. Well, thanks. That's really nice. Yeah, I mean, I, for, it's true. You know, so I was somebody who was a trained uh, historian, and that was I, that was kind of something that I sort of saw in this was the immigrant story, and of course, the different to me the different economic statuses, which is sort of yes. I think you know I don't, I don't obviously in the band they all got rich, so it eventually it didn't matter. But at some point, I always think about the fact that Eddie and Alex who were driving what basically was like a beat up Scooby-Doo van, 70s van that had like different colored doors on it, had to drive into that huge property at the Roth mansion, which was where Dave and his father lived, which is this 20 room <laughs> literal mansion. I mean, literal right. mansion with like columns and like a swimming pool and a tennis court, you know, and be like, wow, this is where at least, <laughs> I mean, it had to be kind of a, I, that was, you know, people ask me like, what would be the one question you would want to ask Eddie? Actually, that was, you know, I, I had hoped to interview from the book and I didn't get the chance to. But that was like one of the questions, which was pretty straightforward. It's like, what the hell did you guys think when you drove onto that property and saw that for the first time? And so I'm like, is this for real? Is this for real? Right. This guy's going to be in our band. I mean, you know, it ended up being, of course, the perfect place for them because they could practice in the practice, basement, as everybody yeah. knows. And it was right. a great it was a great all around deal for them. But that was uh, definitely very, like you said, in terms of uh, the. Uh, the landscape of life in Pasadena, there were some very wealthy people and there were some people who were, again, much more, much more ordinary and to have those two groups of people come together in that band. Another cool story. Yeah. And of course, I loved it, you know, just so we bring in a little bit of uh, Michael Anthony, because, um, you know, it almost looks like sometimes like what did he add? But t take him out. And and what did you, you can't take him out? You know, I, I used to think about it even as a kid because, you know, David Lee Roth was right up front. You know, there was Alex, there was Eddie. And it was like, oh, he plays the bass. And, you know, like what he doesn't really sing. But I didn't even realize how much he sang, you know, when I was younger yeah. and, until the videos came out and you saw him singing and the notes that he hit. And it was like without him, it was just that extra element of like, now we got it. Like it's 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 them, you know. Yeah, and he brought so much to the band. I mean, I think one of the one of the great compliments that 
I got to put in the book about Mike is that Ted Templeman said that uh, one of his regrets as a record producer from the first record was he said, he said, I spent more time working with Dave on his vocals and a little bit more on Eddie, trying to helping Eddie sort of think about his guitar parts. Like what, we, you know, it was also great. I just kept wanting to work with Eddie be like, oh, yeah, do this, do this, do more of this, do more of this. And he said, that, but the thing was, he said, Mike didn't need any of my help. He said, but in retrospect, I should have, you know, I wish I'd spent more time with Mike kind of coaching, Mike, just just being with Mike, he said, but Mike was so good. I was like, this guy doesn't need help. <laughs> let me, you know, and it's sort of like he's the bass player, obviously, he's the supporting part, but he said he sang so great. He played so great. He said he was always dead on. And again, that's sort of the, that was sort of the glue, right? And Van Halen was like Mike with the vocals and the bass parts and also had that great understanding of that he was, had to be, um, you know, sort of stand back and let Eddie have the spotlight, have right. Dave be the spotlight and, and be a guy like I'm the supporting part here. But again, without him, right, it just wouldn't have it just wouldn't have worked as well. He was he was great because he did sing on those Van Halen records. I mean, that voice is just his voice colors that whole that whole sound. Absolutely. And, uh, and he always thing. looked like he was having fun. Yeah. Any, I mean, right, any concert, go on any concert live and you see him and he's just smiling like I got the best gig in the whole world. Here I yeah. am. You know? And, he, and uh, the one thing that's nice about him, too, is that uh, I had the one conversation with him, I interviewed him for the book. And, you know, by all accounts, he's like and I got my experience with him. He's just the nicest guy. I mean, he's like, you know, he's like totally unaffected. He's like not. He's like the type of guy you could bump into at McDonald's and would sit down and probably talk to you and just like be normal. I mean, just oh, where he's just awesome. unaffected by uh, by fame, where obviously there's a lot of other people who are in the same milieu who are not going to he's not going to want to do that and just sort of be like out there. Obviously, no, obviously, so he's really great. Yeah, just the greatest guy. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's awesome to hear. And I want to tell everybody your website is amazing. Go on Greg's. I'm going to have the link underneath here. Go on Greg's website because if you're a huge Van Halen fan like we are, you're going to want to go on there. He's got some great pictures, got some great articles, and um, you also have a Facebook page, which yeah. I, you know, said that you know I found you. But um, do you are you doing any other books coming up, or you know anything you yeah, want to share? Sure. Um, it's Van Halen. It's Van, I, I had been teasing this for a while because I I had not gotten uh, all my ducks in a row with it, but. Uh, I'm doing a Ted Templeman's authorized biography. So Ted has had this great career. I got to know him through writing Van Halen Rising. And, uh, you know, along with obviously doing the Van Halen records, Ted did the Doobie Brothers records. He did Carly Simon, Little Feet, ah. got to hang out with um, Linda Ronstadt. He did a whole bunch of other stuff at Warner Brothers as we went into the 80s. He was a record executive. He did obviously Dave's solo records. He did Aerosmith. He did Honeymoon Suite. And so wow. he had this day, uh, had this really uh, cool tr career trajectory as well, where he started out. He was an artist, so he's actually in a group called Harper's Bazaar, which is sort of a soft, soft rock, like uh, kind of like the Association, right? You know, in the in the, in the like sixty seven, sixty eight, and so Ted had this moment where he was sort of a pop star, like on the Ed Sullivan Show and stuff like this. So Ted has this really interesting career, and uh, I'm really excited. Ted wanted to do this book, and it's just going to kind of track his his life growing up in Santa Cruz up through his career with Warner brothers and beyond and talk about his, it's just, you know, what it was like for him working with all these great artists and ah. Ted's a guy who was just, uh, just had so much success. And I think was probably, uh, underappreciated in some ways because he's sort of a guy who's never really sought out the spotlight. Like, like a lot of record producers are sort of like, yeah, well, you know, I'm right. the producer. I don't want the, the credit that goes to the, all the artists, but, but clearly Ted was a guy who knew how to put all the pieces in place for so many of these great groups like the Doobie brothers and, and Van Halen, and we go down the list of all the great artists, Aerosmith, and he's, he made these great these great records that sold really well and were, for me, defining as a, you know, the Van Halen records were defining for me as a childhood. I grew up like every other every other American guy and or gal who was driving around in the 70s and 80s, you would hear yes. Doobie Brothers every, like every five minutes you heard a Doobie Brothers song, and so Absolutely. Ted did all those records, and so Michael McDonald, and so it's it's really kind of a cool thing for me. I'm, I'm extremely excited about it, and uh, to sort of put all those pieces in place about the Van Halen history, but also about all these other bands and about Warner brothers records writ large about the label. Cause that oh, was kind yeah. of the go-go years of the record industry. It's, it's really great. So I'm very excited. It should be about a year or so out. Um, we haven't settled on awesome. a title yet. It's going to come out from ECW press, which is the same press that did Van Halen rising. So I'm super excited about it. And uh, it's going to be, I think a, another, uh, give another perspective on the Van Halen story for Van Halen fans, but for everyone else who also, of course, like me, has all other bands like Aerosmith and Sammy Hagar. Absolutely. You know, VOA, Ted did that record and it worked with Montrose. So if you're interested in those other groups as well, Ted's going to tell his stories about, you know, what it was like to be in the, involved with all those great artists along the way. Well, you're such a great writer. I can't wait to read it. And you know where to find Thanks. me. You, you want a reader? 
Just give it to me. I'll read. I'm here. I'll read it for you. Yeah. <laughs> then I can stalk you again for you to do another one. So I, I am so happy. You have no idea. I was excited all day today knowing that I was going to get to do this interview. I really was. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. And I can't wait for your oh. next book. And can you show everybody the cover again before we sure. go? Yeah. There it is. Van Halen Rising. Yeah. Perfect. So, yeah, Perfect. artwork done by uh, my friend Vane. He did a great job on the artwork, kind of putting it all together with this collage. And, yeah, I just uh, really appreciate you taking the time to talk about the, the writing process. And that's the, a, lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of good days and a lot of bad days as a writer. So this is, it's always fun when it's done and, and people have enjoyed it where it's out. And that's, yeah. that's a great thing. So I, I really am uh, appreciative of all the, all the support for people. And, of course, thank you so much for having I, me I'm on. a huge fan, Greg. So, you know, keep writing and I'll keep reading whatever you write. So Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, and I have a nice evening. And uh, like hey, I said, I'll, all of Greg's links. Go ahead. Hey, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm around. People connect with me. Thank you so much, Michelle. I will. I have all your links, and you know they can find you everywhere. So thank you, Greg. Awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye bye. Hi everyone, it is 9.15 at night and I just got done talking to Greg Renoff and I am so happy. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, if you've made it this far, then you know like how much fun that video was and I just want to thank him. I will have all of Greg's links listed underneath this video and, um, and you can find him everywhere. So thank you guys.